Hey, Tommy, uh, do you remember a couple weeks ago we did a podcast about the surprisingly good cars we've driven over the last decade? Yeah, that's right. In this video, we are going to do the top 10 surprisingly bad cars we've driven. Yeah, um, you know, it's the flip side of the coin, uh, and I think... Uh, we're blessed and lucky enough to have a very large audience, which allows us to pretty much drive, well, we don't drive Ferraris and Bugattis, but every new car on the market. And let's face it, they all can't be winner, winner, chicken dinner. That's right. Now, we're probably going to upset some folks in this video, but I think that's okay. These are just our opinions, and you're welcome to have a different opinion in the comment section below if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening via Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We're glad to have you on, and a huge thank you to our Patreon supporters who make this podcast possible. And I understand that we have a lot of YouTube channels and that we have a lot of, well, two podcasts, TikTok, but all that stuff, Tommy, is in one convenient place, tfl-studios.com. Uh, check it out, uh, and uh, you can stay up to date. This uh, recent uh, week, we've actually had a lot of breaking news, uh, and so if you are uh, going there and using it as, let's say, a little app that you download to your uh, iPhone or Android device, then you would know about all the brand new cars that were introduced. All right, so let's get right to it. What's number 10, dude? Well, number 10 is a vehicle we drove a number of years ago. So we started reviewing these cars in about 2009, right? That's when we got into this, this little world, and it's been a big pleasure to have all of you out there join us on this adventure. And this was a vehicle that I was really excited about, and I was pretty young at the time, and in my mind, I thought it was such a cool looking car. It is the Jeep Patriot. So this was a small SUV built by Jeep, but it was so squared off. Big round lights, seven slotted grille, had these nice boxy fenders, and it looked, um, to me at the time, like a great little off-roader. And then we drove it, and it was um, not, not brilliant. Yeah, we recently also did a podcast where we talked about this vehicle, the car you should not buy used, uh, because uh, it doesn't have a stellar reputation for reliability, uh, but it does have a stellar reputation for taking the Jeep brand and bringing it down market, trying to kind of sprinkle some of that magic that Jeep brings to the Wrangler, to the Gladiator, and put it on a rent-a-car special. Now, this was kind of the peak of the Daimler-Benz Chrysler partnership. And I think that the Germans probably didn't necessarily give the Americans the money they needed to develop uh, all new platforms that really would have been world leading and they probably didn't give them the freedom they needed to do so as well. The Patriot is a front engine, uh, front wheel drive or all wheel drive platform, which I think shares its uh, underpinnings with the Dodge Caliber. Does it have a low range? does not have a low range. So, uh, you know, it, if you've been listening to our podcast or watching our videos, uh, you know that uh, it's it's changing, but in general, and there are some vehicles like, let's say, the new Bronco Sport that doesn't have a low range that are actually exceptionally good off-road. But for the most part, uh, at least in the past, the delineating line between a real off-roader and a wannabe has been the lack or the inclusion of a low-speed transfer case. I agree. Now, this did have a all-wheel drive system called the Freedom Drive 2. That's a good name, right? Jeep has so many crazy names. Yeah, but names. that's a good name. Freedom Drive. <laughs> Freedom Drive FD2, huh? Yeah, so there was a Freedom Drive 1, but FD1. this was, was also a Freedom Drive 2. The Freedom Drive 2, I believe, was a CVT-equipped Patriot with, like, an extra... Um, crawl ratio, so to speak. So it kind of locked the CVT in a position that would uh, give it a, um, a, a sort of like crawling simulation. But, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't very impressive. Um, although, the Patriot was able to come equipped with the trail-rated badging. Yeah, um, and the other issue, of course, with this vehicle was that it was a wash in cheap, greasy plastics. <laughs> if, you know, if... if if you're looking at like let's say an Apple device or a lot of the new uh, new kind of high tech gadgets that are out there, they actually have nicer packaging that you inevitably end up throwing away than this vehicle had in terms of its like plastics that it used on its dashboard, on its armrest, and you know usually we like to say you know anywhere you touch or you put your arm is soft. Here it was the exact opposite. It was a little bit of a porta potty on the inside. And, and you remember like the little like uh, it had an all wheel drive lock that was like this paddle that you yeah lift this up. weird like little tooth you know and then the one we had it wasn't even straight in the hole so it was like a little <laughs> it looked like a little T and you put you put your fingers in and pull up on it. This thing was like all crooked in there. Yeah, it was, it was, it was like it was like the guy who was installing it like didn't even give a rats you know what about like the the, the way that it was uh 
uh, centered in the little cubby that it lived in. It was assembled in Belvedere at the... Uh, yes, I know the Belvedere plant, Belvedere, Illinois, uh, which uh, saved um, at that at one, when I was, you know, your age, I was a television reporter uh, and I worked in Janesville, Wisconsin for WIFR TV. And I've actually been to the Belvedere plant because at that point they were manufacturing K cars, Ooh. which under Lee Iacocca saved the brand, uh, which was also a horribly, horribly awful car. And you know what's crazy, Tommy? Like now I'm bringing a trailer like like low mileage K cars, which uh, to my mind were the Ladas of the American, uh, and sorry, Andre, I know you love Lada, but it's <laughs> not a good vehicle, uh, of the American car industry. And now they're becoming collectible. Aries yeah. K, um, just, you know, horrible, horrible platform sharing, plastic uh, built, uh, uh, obsolescent inducing uh Throw up in my throat. Uh, okay, we get it. Uh, yes, just you, horrible you, cars. You, you've very much made your point. Because I had to spend like two years driving an Aries K with Action News on it that had velour red interior, Tommy, with a big column shifter uh, that that you know spent more time in the shop than it did parked at the TV station. I think from someone that wasn't from that era, yeah, they are kind of cool. There's kind of an allure to the K car. You, you, uh, yes, there you, is. You look at them too hard and plastic falls off of them. Yeah, but that was, I mean, it's so funny. Just don't stare at it for too long, okay? Because plastic will fall off. It'll just self-extricate and bing, right off the car. For example, one of the clay K platforms was the LeBaron, right? That was a K model. Yeah. And you could get the LeBaron not only in a convertible, but with wood paneling on the side. And that, that kind of has like a, a slight allure to someone my age because it's just so weird and funky and out there. There is a very small part of me that thinks the K platform is pretty cool. You could also get them with turbocharged engines. Don't forget that, right? It's like it's like driving your grandmother's living room, Tommy. What about the <laughs> first minivan? The first minivan you could get with a turbo engine and a manual transmission. I mean, these are things that get people my age excited because they're so weird and different look, from what look, you can get today. I, 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 the, the thing saved, Mer saved Chrysler, uh, probably saved the economy in northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin, but that doesn't mean it was a good car. You know, you you you, you 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 could be both. You could be a terrible car and at the same time save a company, which I know sounds weird, but that's exactly what happened. Well, when you look at the Patriot, right, it's mm. not all bad news because there were a couple of cool things about it. You could get it. The headlights with a, were kind of cool. Design-wise, I think it was brilliant. Yeah. It was a phenomenal thing to look at. It looked rugged and off-roady. And it was cheap. It was dirt cheap. In price and in <laughs> the construction. But it did get a lot of people that just needed a very affordable all-wheel drive car on the roads in snowy environments. Manual transmission was available. Yes. Can't forget that pretty cool thing. And there's people now that do lift kits for them and you can make them look pretty cool even if they may not have the offer hey, capability. Hey, hey, what's this sound? I don't know. That's the sound of my youth, Tommy. That is the sound of like big uh, Ford LTDs with open diffs trying to uh, clear a snow-covered parking space. That's all I remember hearing, right, uh, when, when I was your age. Uh, and you're right, the Patriot did actually allow people to drive to work when it snowed as opposed to having, you know, bad tires on an open diff rear-wheel drive car that would just spin and spin and spin with, you know, the slightest amount of uh, frosty precipitation. What does it have to do with the Patriot? Well, it's one of, like you said, it's one of the first cars that made all-wheel drive affordable. Oh, oh yeah, that yeah. was good. Yeah, and you know then, what I mean? It, it made it like it brought all-wheel drive to the masses. And then in 2014, it got a Hyundai six-speed automatic. So it got better in the final years of, of the Patriots. They built it all the way through, I think, 2017. Which and is pretty straight good. to rent a car. Well, yes, they did sell a lot of them to rental cars. But I still think there is somewhat of a charm around the Patriot, even if it wasn't a good car. It still has a small piece of my interest, just like the K car. You know, I learned this. So, uh, you know, I was born in Prague and then I moved to Prague when it went from communist to capitalist. And there were uh, some pretty terrible cars that Skoda built under the capitalist, right? And I learned this lesson. The capitalist no, or the communist? Uh, under the communist. Okay. And the capitalist, actually. Uh, uh, both. But uh, I learned this lesson that there will always be people who will fall in love with a vehicle that is um, not... Uh, terribly reliable because the, it's like it's like one of those operatic relationships. The more you have to invest in that relationship, the more you and deeper you go down the rabbit hole, and the more you fall in love. So there are people who love you know some of the worst cars in the world. I think the best example of that is probably the love and the care that that's been put on uh, put upon all the cars in Cuba, right? All those fifties American cars, which you know most of them weren't tri fives, right? Most of them were just pretty 
big, fat, uh, lazy, girthy, lumpy. Okay, now now you're coming right at the jugular here. Don't go after my 50s American cars. They but, were cool and they were good but cars. But in, in, in Cuba, you know, there's so much love bestowed on those vehicles, uh, and that is because there is no choice. I think people just love cars like people love horses like people love dogs and and sometimes the worse the car is the more you're involved with it and the more you love it are you saying a 1957 ford fairlane is a bad car i'm saying that they're they're fan fan girl and boy groups for every vehicle you had you had so many great examples to go after and you went after my old 50s American cars. You know what cars? I should go after? This is, you're going to hate this. You should have gone after no, the Trabant. No, There's I'm, a huge I'm, amount of love yeah, for the Trabant. No, no. I'm going to go after. I'm gonna, you want me to go to the jugular? Yeah. I'll go, British sports cars. Brit- MGBs, TR7s, TR6s. What's wrong with the TR6? They're, they're all just gloriously horrible. They are not gloriously horrible. <laughs> they are gloriously horrible. They're not. <laughs> they fall apart. They're dangerous. Uh, uh, but people love them. And right now, they're, of course, they're out of favor. So this is a good time. If you guys are into, like, obviously the Miata came along and kind of made it reliable. But if you're into classic British sports cars, they are about as cheap as they can get. It's funny, like, bring a trailer. All these crazy cars are setting, uh, you know, these, like an Integra just sold for over 100,000, Integra Type R. They're setting all these records, and yet some of the coolest cars in the world right now are, you know, less than $10,000. And that's because it's like the Harley thing, right? Harley's become cool uh, when, like, the doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs are finally past the age of having to raise children, and, the, and their wives says, okay, now you can go to Harley, and then, like, all these old dudes start riding them, and then the young dudes are like, oh, my God, this is just an old dude thing. And then they become uncool, and then, you know, the next generation comes through, and then they become cool again. And that's what's happening, I think, with the old British cars. They're super uncool right now. So now is the time to go get yourself that MGB or Bug-Eyed Sprite or uh, TR Spitfire. You know, I-, I would love to have a Spitfire. I don't fit in it. My friend Fred had one. I would love to have one of those. After you just said they're terrible cars. Uh, yes, I would, you are I, not I, making I, a huge look, amount of sense to me at this look, point. The problem with, with all those cars is I don't fit in any of them. So, I, well, I look okay, like, I look like I'm driving a bathtub. You can't say they're terrible cars because you're an American. I mean, that doesn't I didn't say I'm they're terrible sense. cars. Where did I say they're? I'm actually not. I was born we're, in Europe. We're going to have to rewind the podcast here when you I, just I mean, said I'm that American. all British cars are terrible. No, I said all those old British sports cars were pretty darn terrible because they were <laughs> incredibly the unreliable uh, and they fell apart when you looked at them and they're very expensive to maintain, but they are way cool. I was actually, so I've got a buddy named Ted who's like yeah. the go-to British car. And he, he loves making fun of British cars because all he does is fix them all day. Yeah, exactly. But believe it or not, I asked him, I said, what is the best British car you can own? And he said, the MGB, if if you, you put just a little bit of love into them, they can be incredibly reliable, very long-lived, super fun to drive. Old Triumph Spitfires are a great example of a car that are just not very good. Spitfires are not a great example of an old British car. But... An MGB can be made pretty fun. So I don't think it's fair to lump all British cars into one into one category. Well, as a, as a genre of, because they all have kind of that, that country gentleman vibe to them, right? They're all convertibles. Uh, and some, some the ones that are affordable are all the tiny ones. Like, obviously, a Jaguar is going to be much more expensive, right? An F-Type, those things are not... Uh, uh, affordable at this point, but it seems like the bigger ones are less affordable than the smaller ones for some reason. So all the big ones, you know, like the Jaguars. What's uh, the um, what's another one uh, that, that, that that's actually got some room in it that's convertible and that's British and old? Oh well, there's, there's a ton of them. But anyways, I think we should move off the subject because I can just, right. I can hear people just tuning out as we speak. Okay, all right, let's go down to number nine. And by the way, I will do a Roman's rant. So uh, you just did one. No, you that's just wasn't attacked rant. my entire that livelihood. No, no, of no, no, that was just classic a, cars. That here. was just a statement of fact. It's not and an opportunity for anybody who wants an old British first car. First, you attacked old American fifties cars. Then you attacked old oh, British I, I, cars. I will attack all American. No, Anything tri- else look, you can tri- attack? The Tri Five Chevy was incredible, Tommy. But a lot of those fifty cars were just like, like wallowy, girthy. Well, sure, but it was the fifties in America. That's what they were. Under you pow- underpowered. You, you can't thirsty. fault them for being part of their time. They, they 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 would you know if you got in a frontal car accident, oh the, the steering wheel would sure would, would, was, would spear you in the chest. It was nineteen fifty four, but that was the technology. Before safety glass your head would go through the thing it would peel your face off these were horrible things tommy so by all accounts then anything old is horrible 
No, because no, it's are... unsafe and slow. And no, 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 no. I said I love the Tri Fives. They're beautiful as design, as pieces of incredible American design. They're just all of them in three years. Chevy blew. You know, I mean, that's never going to happen again. Where three years in a row, you got these incredible designs. Uh, stylistically, they were good. Everything else, not so good. My Anyways. blood pressure is through the roof right now because you're right. making so many contradictions. Ah. But, Tommy, you'll learn as you get older, life is full of contradictions. Yeah. Like the Ford Eco, or is it Echo Sport, which is number nine on our list. Yeah, so this was the, they finally discontinued this thing, but this was kind of a pile. <laughs> so this was a subcompact crossover, originally built by Ford. Didn't, didn't, your, Ford, didn't your friend just buy one? Does she listen to this? Oh, absolutely not. But <laughs> She bought one, but she doesn't listen to it? Is that what you're saying? Originally built by Ford of Brazil. So this was... Um, I thought I, they were built in India. Well, okay, hold up. All right. The second generation was launched in 2012. Um, and was also built in like India and Russia and Thailand and all these other. They markets. were thir- they were they were like thir- they were like third world third world cars that Ford designed for for emerging markets. The idea was kind of an interesting thing to have like this little itty bitty kind of little crossover off roady uh, vehicle, but what it turned into was just a cut rate. Uh, economy well, vehicle that was so bad to drive, so bad to sit in. Well, I think what happened was you had this new class of vehicles that came out in America, the compact crossover, right? So like you had the Jeep Renegade, you know what I'm saying? And then Ford didn't have uh, a, a freshly uh, a designed competitor, so they looked into their world market uh, mm-hmm. and they came out with the... Uh, well, I, I'm serious. I've asked Ford and some of the engineers say Eco, some of them say Echo. So, you know, you pick whichever one you want, Sport, um, to, to go head to head with this new class of compact crossover, off roady crossover that was becoming popular in America. Like when Jeep started selling like tens of thousands of the Renegades, Ford, you know, ears perked up and thought, hey, there's a market here. I was so excited when they launched it in the U.S. with the rear-mounted spare tire. That was the coolest part about the Echo Sport is you could get a full-size spare on the back. I'm like, oh, this is going to be a cool little affordable off-roader. And it was none of that. It was not cool. It was it was sort of affordable, but like the titanium models got pretty darn expensive. They got crazy expensive. You'd think that this would be like an entry level and they get up to like 28000 Yeah. And you know what? Uh, I, I figured out Ford dealerships use them for. They would use them for like those... Uh, um, service loaners, so they would use them as a service loaner, and then they would give them uh, to customers when they were having their vehicles fixed, and then eventually they would sell them for less money because they were used, and they did pretty well with that, but that's that's kind of where they went. Uh, and here in Colorado, they were very popular because, of, of course, all-wheel drive, and I love the design, actually. They were very cute. It was just that they were very tinny and under-engineered it would be, I think, a good way to look at it. I mean, the, the, the like, if you got the base model, you got these, like, LED displays, right? It had uh, a Tech, it had a speedometer that looked like you know something that, that should have been on the can of a of a of a cup of of, of a like a like like a, like like um, here I, I think I can explain it. Okay, so if I'm, you look I'm at stuck. the yeah you're you're struggling here a little. If you look at like the gauge cluster, right, yeah. it's just a stamped piece of flat black blast flat <laughs> black plastic. So there are no bezels on the gauges. Exactly. It's just a black slate with some white letters I was printed going, on top. What I was going for was like a label on a soup can. Well, that took a lot of thinking to come to there. <laughs> That's what I was going for. All right, but the Echo Sport finally, I think, is going away. Although it's still on the Ford Build and Configure website. I guess if you want, once again, kind of like the Patriot, a dirt, dirt cheap SUV that has all-wheel drive. This could be an option. You can get it with a one-liter EcoBoost, so little itty-bitty so, turbo. So you know what is still amazing to me um, is that you know when I once again when I was your age, I went and bought a Suzuki Sidekick, which was basically like Suzuki's take on a miniature Wrangler, right? The Samurai. Yeah, the Samurai. Yeah. And the Sidekick, Samurai uh, more so than the Sidekick, but nevertheless, you know that was you know an open-top convertible, tiny shrunk Wrangler is one way you could look at it. And, and it was hugely popular. Uh, and now, of course, off-roaders are blowing up and the Wrangler is selling over 200,000 units. And yet, no one, you know, instead of building that for, you know, import of the EcoSport, EcoSport, uh, but no one has built like a two-thirds or, you know, smaller sized Wrangler. I think Jeep is working on that. We've seen some spy images, but that thing should have been out like five years ago. 
Suzuki has one abroad. They have a Jimny, yeah. Abroad. And it is exactly what you want, which is a little tiny, affordable 4x4. Four by, four by four. Yeah. But yeah. they don't bring it to the States. Yeah, it's got to be square and boxy and have a low range. Uh, it would sell like hotcakes. It would be cute and make it safe. Uh, the Suzuki Samurai was... At that time, not the safest vehicle, but yeah, I think that would be hugely popular. All right, so what's number eight on our list, dude? <laughs> well, number eight, this was one of actually the first press cars that we drove, and it was the Chevrolet Aveo, which I think was just a terrible name for a car to begin I with. I say a rebranded uh, Daihatsu, a Korean Daihatsu that Chevy rebranded, if I remember right. Well, I think it might be a Daewoo. Was it Daewoo? Okay, so I'm sorry. Uh, my Korean domestic car knowledge is not as strong as yours, Tommy. <laughs> Now, the kind of, we had the facelifted uh, Aveo is, is the model we drove. And I just remember it was, it was just, it was miserable. I mean, this was one of those cases where it would have been okay if it was really, really cheap. But the one they sent us in the fleet had some of the single most tackiest fake wood from the finest American plastic trees I've ever seen. It was like this horrible, shiny, had this fake leather interior, which was just terrible. It drove badly. It was Buzzy, slow. underpowered. It was miserable. Didn't break, didn't shift, didn't and I was turn. Just, I was so offended by the fact that this upscale trim was trying to pretend to be luxurious in any way. Like if it was crappy, but three grand or whatever, uh, I mean, obviously unrealistic, but that would be fine. This thing was trying to be like, oh, look at me, I've got wood and leather, and none of it was real. It was just crummy. So, yeah, you know, there's this... Unfortunately, there was this thing in America where you get all three in the car world. You get cheap, you get small, and you get um, um, unsafe, right? And this is kind of the height of it. And you don't have to have all three. You, you, you could be small, inexpensive, and safe, or you could be... Uh, small, expensive, and very safe. But this was those car. This this car, unfortunately, uh, you know, had had not a lot of great engineering built into it. So it had the triple whammy of being cheap in the worst sense, of being small in the worst sense, where it didn't have a lot of room on the inside. Like what made a lot of the Japanese cars special is that they were small, but they were very roomy on the inside, right? You can design a car that has that magic quality of being bigger on the inside than the outside. Uh, and then, of course, I don't recall the safety ratings, but if I remember right, this you can probably look it up. How, how were the crash tests on this thing? Well, they were not as bad in America as you'd expect. Okay. But one of the big downfalls was, and I'm, I'm just reading some of the reviews from the air, and I'm now remembering this, is that they had really, really bad fuel economy for the size of the vehicle. So they had these little four-cylinder engines, but... Uh, so so I'll, I'll take it all back. So maybe it was cheap, small, and thirsty. Uh, 2011 was the final model year. And on the Wikipedia page, it made some interesting lists, including Forbes, one of the worst cars on the road, um, worst in overall safety from Consumer Reports. Yeah, I, so I was right. Worst Thank you. Worst fuel yeah. uh, economy. And so I can add that. So I'm not taking it back. So now it's, it's not only thirsty, unsafe, small, and cheap. Right, all of them. All of them, all of them. All right, um, let's go number seven. Tell me what's number seven. So number seven is actually made by a company which typically, Should know better. typically makes extremely good cars, but this was kind of a dud. So this is the Honda Civic, and specifically it was a one-year only um, kind of deal. Here in the States, right, we got the ninth generation Civic, and uh, the, the, the kind of launch model, right, 2012 I think it was, it it wasn't much liked so they kind of they kind of fudged it up a little bit and they really quickly realized this and almost immediately redesigned it and improved it but it had a really kind of crummy interior on the inside it didn't drive very well compared to the outgoing model and it was just kind of a dud yeah uh, it was weird I, the, I was there when it was unveiled and we all kind of looked at it and we thought wow that is just Boring and, you know, the definition of like taking a, an interesting car and making it into a refrigerator uh, and then decontenting and making everything just, you know, very, it, it looked like, like somehow at Honda, the um, accountants, bean cutters uh, got uh, to design the car as opposed to the engineers. And as we know, Honda is a very um, engineering driven company and they're proud of that fact, right? It's, it's always been about... Uh, great engineering, and yet this car looked like it was designed by um, the accountants and not the engineering team. And then Consumer Reports actually removed the 2012 Civic from its recommended list of compact cars, which is very unusual because, I mean, that has been a staple of that list for a long time. So they redesigned it for 2013 and did improve a lot of the yeah, issues. And keep, keep in mind, usually, you know, the Japanese cars have four-year 
design cycles with a, a two-year refresh, and this was uh, like definitely an outlier. <laughs> and, yeah, they, the and, and you got to give it to Honda. They did listen to the customers. Uh, and, you know, there was a, a same thing happened to the Subaru WRX. Remember? I don't, and I don't know what year that was. Maybe since you're furious at Googling over there, you can Google. But one year, Subaru decided to do the same thing with the WRX. They, they decided to basically make it into a glorified economy car and took all of the uh, bad boy, um, street racer, uh, you know, um, uh, WRC heritage out of the thing and just make it into a, a plain Jane vanilla commuter that that was stickered up and spoilered up instead of actually having the the real cred of being a, a quick and fun and fast and furious car. I don't remember what the year. I think it was 2010 or 2011. It was in that same time period. And I remember... Uh, one year only as well. I remember, I think what they did is they did like a weird thing where they gave it a single exhaust pipe. Yeah, exactly. I don't know WRX is very well. Someone will it let had, me know. If you look, it had, it had, that was the one that had the single exhaust pipe. It was detuned. It was just, it was, once again, they like made it into a refrigerator for some unbeknownst reason. Uh, and those are the ones you don't want if you're out there looking for a used... Uh, WRX. Uh, and then, um, you know, there's some honorable mentions here for Honda. Um, you put it on the list. Uh, and that is, of course, the uh, second gen Honda Insight. Uh, I, I would say that was also a, a, a dud. Yeah, that was when Prius came out uh, and Honda quickly tried to respond with uh, a vehicle that would compete with Prius and they did a very poor job of it. Now, the first gen Insight was the one that kind of looked like a toad, but it was a super revolutionary uh, the first hybrid that made it to the market with the manual transmission. Yeah, it was the first market in America, first hybrid in America. We had one, uh, and we got we, that was the one where we got taken. Two-seater, uh, kind of a sporty thing, right, more or less. And then the second generation came around, and they, they, they did fix a lot of the issues that people had with the Insight, right, which was it was too small and only two seats. And they came out with the big one, which had a hatchback or, like, liftback like the Prius, and it had... Um, bigger interior and it was so much more usable but it kind of lost the magic and and the prius i believe the prius was a little bit more efficient in, in pretty much every way and then that kind of took off as being the the icon that it is today whereas the insight just didn't really have what it took to compete i remember i had a, a teacher in middle school that that wanted one of these he actually didn't want one of these he wanted an yeah. ipad and they were given you know you're in trouble when you have to give an ipad away when you buy a car it was at the very launch of the ipad and if you bought an Insight, which was severely reduced as it was, the price-wise, they gave you an iPad. So we bought the Insight to get the iPad and then ended up hating the Insight. So there you go. If you're going to buy a car, buy it for the car and not for any kind of perks that come along with it. Yeah, it's just boring design. And, uh, it, you know, there was nothing, it, was, it wasn't particularly fuel efficient. It wasn't particularly, uh, you know cool to look at it was just it was just like it was just like boring god you know you fall asleep just having one drive by you be careful if you see one of those look away tommy look away now the next vehicle on our list is one that i almost completely forgot about and maybe lexus would prefer i did but it is the lexus hs 250h so this once again same era like came out i think 2010 or around the, that time period and they did two right they did the little uh, hatchback called the CT, right? And the, the CT was kind of funky. It had all these weird colors and it was kind of sporty to drive and it looked very, very cool. And then at a similar time period, they came out with something called the HS, which was a sedan. And it was it was just kind of, it was kind of a dud in, in a lot of ways. It was too small, too ugly, not quite as fuel efficient as like a Prius and quite expensive. I think it was, a, I think if I remember right, it was, uh, they took a European Accord and basically turned it into a Lexus. Uh, and then, uh, the the call uh, the, the claim to fame on that car was they used bamboo to make it very environmentally sound. So that if I remember the press release, it was something like the the, the, the wood was bamboo. I but don't think it would be an Accord. That doesn't make a lot of no, sense. No, not an Accord, a Camry. Sorry. Um, I think it was a European Camry that got turned into the. Gotcha. Yeah, sorry, not Accord. I'm um, still <laughs> yeah. stuck on Honda, uh, and that that's you know, and then they um, hybridized it and brought it in as a Lexus, uh, and yeah, it was just uh, once again, it, you know, it. it paid the ultimate price because it was one of those cars uh, that was banal, boring, and completely uninspired in any way. Uh, and, and, you know, when the most interesting thing you can say about it is that there's bamboo in the thing, I believe, then, then you're probably, you know, not going to sell a ton of them. Now, I just looked it up because I was curious. The related platform is the Toyota Avensis. 
and it was based on the new MC platform, which underpinned the Corolla, the Prius, um, some other vehicles as well, the, the, the Lexus CT, which was the one I just talked about. Hybrid only here in the States as well. I think front wheel drive only, if I remember right. But it, I remember it being particularly cramped. So it had like a really kind of small cabin and uh, insanely slow. I think it had uh, a, a relatively um, low power uh, powertrain, somewhere around 140 horsepower is what I'm reading right now. So it's a... Uh, it just kind of fell on its face, and you never see them around. So you, I see a lot of Lexuses. You see the ESs and even the GSs, LS. I very rarely see the you, HS. You know what the flip side HS. of the of the, HS, of the uh, HS 250H is? There's a flip side. It, it, was, it came out at the same time. You know what kind I'm talking? It was also a Lexus. Yeah, the CT. Yeah, the CT. That was a that was a vehicle that kind of flew under the radar, but that turned out to be actually really, really good. I'm looking at the sales numbers yeah. on the HS. They launched in 09 with 6,700. 2010 was its biggest year, 10,600 in the States. And then 2,649, and then they sold five in 2013. Yeah. So yeah. It, qu it quickly fell on its face. So the CT200 was this little economy uh, Lexus uh, that uh, was actually really cool, and I think way ahead of its time. It, it kind of foreshadowed uh, much better cars to come. Uh, and right now, if you can find one, it's a great car for like your mom or dad because, um, or grandma or grandpa, because they, they're hybrids. Uh, they're very fuel efficient and they're super easy to use. So it was on that cusp before like technology got to be too crazy, right? When you had big screens. So it had big buttons uh, and the hybrid drive was pretty uh, uh, transparent uh, and it was a Lexus, so it would last forever uh, and had incredible utility. Now, the next vehicle on our list... Before, before we get to that, can I do my rant? We're right at the middle of this list. I, I feel like rant. there's been several rants in this... Oh, I can't just see You've already oh, attacked God. all of my favorite things. Oh, for, uh, old attack. American cars. You millennials. You, old you say, British oh, cars. Oh, uh, the, uh, you know, the... the, the, <laughs> the uh, 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 the Triumph uh, TR6 was, or TR7 was, you know, uh, not a great car because it, oh, you're attacking my cars. No, I'm not. It, I'm just saying the truth. It wasn't a great car. Well, if you could give it's me specifics, if you could be like, you well. Think, you think the TR7 was a good car? The TR7 was a garbage pile. Well, TR don't attack my car, Tommy. You're, oh, you're already ranting and attacking <laughs> TR6 my car. was It was a, was a beautiful car. wedge like vehicle that, you know, was a dream car of my youth, and I had a poster of it up in my room. But when my I was point a kid. is if you're going to attack someone's vehicle, it's not an attack. You have to have specific specific reasons why, why. why is everything with millennials an attack <laughs> it's not a millennial first why of all I'm not a millennial why, big offense to that why is the why is the biggest like <laughs> like like bad thing you can do is be cringy you know sometimes there's a reason that things are cringy and that's because they're wrong and, and being cringy is is like it, you know what it's you know what cringy is like sometimes it's like it's like that um, like when something smells bad, right? It warns you that you shouldn't go near it, or it's you know poisonous, and that's the same thing with cringiness. Sometimes cringiness can be good. I am all for taking down a car, but you gotta give me specifics. You know, there's a lot not, of specifics I can give it. you as to why the TR7 was a bad car. If you can find a good reason why the TR6 was a bad car, because it would it would accordion uh, like a cheap. But uh, that was every car plastic <laughs> bottle. If you got hit by with anything, you know, here here my friend Fred, okay, my friend Fred had an accident in one of those cars, right? Against the, the, the cars that you love, the 1950s cars, which were let's face it, built like you know like tanks, right? Uh, and that that TR6 would accordion like a cheap plastic bottle. You would you would be a quadriplegic if you hit anything faster than you know five miles an hour in that thing. Can I make my point though? And it would roll. If, if that is if it wouldn't roll over you. You are a hundred percent right. But that was every single car pre 1970. Name a car pre 1970. A, a that Ford be LTD right. would not accordion. A Ford LTD would accordion. <laughs> Have you seen the videos of like no, but 50s not like, cars? like the British cars? I mean, all those old cars. I mean, Ford LTDs had a steering column that would impale you, right? All those old cars from the, the 50s. The carburetors and 60s. in that thing would go out of tune after 2,000 miles. See, that is a fair. That is a fair retort. I will give you multiple <laughs> carburetors was a problem. You're right there. <laughs> Uh, but if you weren't driving like a big Mercedes or even a big Volvo, which were safe for their day, but not very safe. Oh, so now you ignore the fact standard. that the thing <laughs> you need a live-in British mechanic to just keep it on the road. There's certain cars. I just think I don't want to like. I don't want to. There's a certain. If you spilled a bottle of water, six days later it would rust. There is a certain YouTuber online that 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 takes a look at, at a make and is like, oh crap, 
Never buy this. Never buy this. Right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's and hate. I, I'm not. I'm not. I don't hate. I'm. I'm. I'm talking I don't want to just experience. turn. I don't want to be that guy that's like, oh, it's an old well, we, X. Come it's on, terrible. Tommy, we never do that. We never be like, never. You know, and stop. And this. You know, like. But this, that's this, where this, that lead roads to. If this, you say, oh, every old British sports car remember, is bad. If I remember this certain YouTuber like two years ago said that Nissan wouldn't last two weeks. Yeah. And yet they just introduced a new Pathfinder. Funny how that works. Huh? But, but, Sometimes getting clicks is more important than being right. But my point is, I don't want to just lump. Everything in one right, can category. I do my, can I do my rant now? My real rant. <laughs> and this really belongs on the. This tr- whole podcast has been nothing no, but no, rants. No, I know it hasn't. <laughs> no, no. This this really belongs on the tr- truck channel. But I, I was recently following a brodozer. You know what I'm talking about? And I was thinking about like what uh, you know making a vehicle cool means. Uh, and, and and if you feel free to disagree with me on this. So what I hate are are the lifted, uh, custom offset uh, trucks. That are like you know 25 feet in the air. I'm just exaggerating. Let's say they're six to nine feet in the air, right? And then then have this massive drop uh, because they needed for the hitch, right? And then they're towing stuff. So if you take a vehicle and you slam it and make it cool, it still works as a vehicle, right? It's still you can still get around it even maybe you're scraping the bottom. Or if you take a vehicle and put big tires on it and make it like an off roader, it still for the most part works be it a truck or a car, the way it was intended to do. But the second you do like a nine inch lift or higher on a truck, and then you have to have like a nine inch drop, you have just, you have just made that an incredibly unsafe uh, and inefficient, and I would, dare I say, dangerous towing rig. So yeah, if you want to bro your thing, go for it, but then please don't pretend like you can tow the same amount that, that the manufacturer put, right? That we, we have towed with bro dozers, uh, and it is a terrifying experience. So you want to make your truck look cool? All oh, go for it. Love it. No issues with it. But don't then, you know, tow 10,000 pounds with it because you're putting other people in danger. And it's just, it just look, and from just a visual point, it looks really stupid. In the first time of the history of the podcast, I agree with you. You do? I do. I agree with you 100%. <laughs> and I know we bickered. I apologize. That's but, okay. Uh, that's right. kind of what we do here. But I do agree that, that you are right. I think that is a ridiculous get, trend. Yeah. Get yourself, like, if you want a tow big and heavy, get yourself, you know, a HD truck and leave it stock. Or better yet, get yourself a work truck, which are the trucks that tow the most. So if you want to go heavy and big, don't brodoze your truck. All right, so next up on the list, number five, we have, speaking of British cars, the Mini Cooper Coupe and Paceman. Now, there was a time a few years ago when Mini decided they needed to take their already small and relatively impractical cars and make them even more impractical. So what they did was they take the, st- the standard Mini hatch, they removed the rear seats and removed the, the, the rather convenient hatchback and turned it into a coupe for some reason, right? And then they did the same thing with the convertible. They took out the handy rear seats and turned it into a roadster. Uh, and they did the same thing actually with the newly introduced at that time Countryman, which was a more usable vehicle, but pretty small. And for some reason they decided they needed a two-door coupe SUV. You know, you know, it's funny, like when the original Mini, who owned Mini? Who was is, who is the company that owned Mini? Uh, British Leyland? Was it a British... Yeah, eventually it was part of British Leyland. Anyway, the original Mini, they went the opposite way, right? So when the Mini became a huge hit, instead of trying to build convertibles and coupes and, uh, you know, they they built pickup trucks and vans mm-hmm. and, and they try to make them into more utilitarian cars. And, of course, BMW went the exact opposite way. I'm not saying one's better or one's worse. It's just interesting that, that you know, one tried to make it more useful and the other one tried to make it cooler. Although we're back to the usefulness, right? Because the latest Minis, like the Countryman, are the biggest they've ever been. And then the new Clubman has four doors in a big trunk. So we're going back in the other direction. But for a while there, they decided to make vehicles like the Paceman, which didn't make any sense, the Coupe and the Roadster. Now, I personally love them because they're kind of rare and stupid, but uh, they're not, they're not, yeah, if, they're not great cars. Go, if you want to go really rare, go for the little van. Those are... Yeah, for a while there, yeah. uh, for just a hot sec, they, they imported, I think, 50 of a model called the Club Van, which was a Clubman without windows in the back. And they only had, like I said, I think it was under 100 imported. And those are super, super rare here in the States. Yeah, they're really uh, uh, sought after now because, once again, you know, scarcity equals collect collectivity? Collect. Uh, and uh, yeah, they uh, are super collectible and uh, super unique. Uh, are they cool or are they fun? Not really, but very collectible. Just because there's not a lot of them out there. Number four on the list is a vehicle. I kind of put it on a list and then I did some more research and it's actually kind of a cool thing because they didn't realize that they had went, gone this far with it. But the GMC Sierra hybrid and then it also had the cousin, the Tahoe hybrid. Do you remember these vehicles? Yeah, there was also an Escalade hybrid. 
Okay, yeah, it's kind of the same realm. Yeah, they they were uh, well. So you know, this was one of the, this was a case of like ten years ago, GM decided to hybridize uh, their big thirsty uh, uh, vehicles, pickup trucks, and SUVs. Unfortunately, uh, they went so mild uh, that the cost of the hybridization uh, outweighed by far the cost of or the savings that you would get by having it. I think these things did not get any better fuel economy, but they did have giant hybrid stickers on them to show that you could own a Tahoe and be environmentally. But I think people saw through that because I think it was like one or two miles to the gallon. There's a bunch, been a bunch of cars. The other one that's like that is the uh, Subaru Crosstrek hybrid. Uh, once again, you pay a lot more and you get you know very little, except a lot of potential technology that can break. And this is actually happening with those uh, early GM hybrids, right? Um, the batteries are failing on them, and it's like that insight we had. If you want to use them because they are hybrids, you got to replace the battery, and that battery is like two to three k now. So you've got a truck that's probably worth at this point, you know, under ten thousand, maybe even under five thousand. Where if the battery goes, which it will, um, you're going to have a three thousand dollar repair bill just to replace the battery. You are, yeah, exactly right. And that's why they're not, I mean, they're just not very good used vehicles to buy because that repair bill is going to be pretty astronomical. And like you mentioned, it's about time to replace the high voltage battery in a lot of these cases. Now, the reason that I I was kind of skeptical about putting this on the surprisingly bad cars is when I was researching the, the Sierra Hybrid, I came across a 2013 press release that GM put out about it, and I didn't realize actually how sophisticated it was. So I thought it was just a mild hybrid system, but it was it was actually really pretty advanced. So if we look at like what the, the 1500 was, it was a full-size truck, and if you got the gasoline model, you had the choice of a 4.3 liter, a, a 4.8 liter, a 5.3, and then the big 6.2. But the hybrid actually got the 6-liter, so the 6-liter Vortec out of the 2500. Mm. And then what I was really surprised about was it doesn't have a transmission. Really? So it's not a mild hybrid system. It's not like a sandwich hybrid system as it's so popular. It's a planetary gear? It's a planetary gear system. Yeah, yeah they called it the um, EVT, yeah. um, which was electric variable transmission. It wasn't a cone. It wasn't like a Yeah, there's, jet there's a lot of modern hybrids that are planetary gear. I know, and yeah. I was impressed that they actually went that far with it. Now, just like you mentioned, Dad, it, it didn't get very good fuel economy. Um, well, you... it did okay. So it got 21 MPG with four-wheel drive, a standard Sierra with four-wheel drive, and the 5.3 got 17. So it got four better, Okay. which is, you know, not, not something to shake a stick at. But uh, I was just impressed that, that not only did it have a different engine, it had this pretty crazy planetary gear thing. So. But not, now you can get, I want to say, the new Tundra Hybrid. Could you look up that? I want to say it's 22. Uh, but it's got a boatload more horsepower. I mean, that thing's almost got 500 horsepower and God knows how much torque. Uh, and so it was like it was like the first attempt at look. GM GM has done some incredible. GM's really good at doing uh, really great and sophisticated engineering, and then either forgetting about it or not promoting it so people don't know. And I think a perfect example of that is the first generation Volt. Yeah. The first generation Volt, as far as I can tell, is an incredible vehicle uh, that you know is bulletproof uh, and offers phenomenal fuel economy for its day has some really interesting drive characteristics like that drivetrain is is so over engineered uh, that the, where there's no connection I think uh, it's been a while since I've actually read the press releases and talked to the engineers so I'm not I don't want to regurgitate stuff but just trust me it's an incredibly complicated drivetrain holy smokes 21 mpg on the um, four wheel drive tundra hybrid yeah. it got the same as the sierra hybrid back in 2013. Yeah, but the horsepower is through the roof. Okay, yes, very good point. But I've changed my mind. You should buy a Sierra hybrid. I think this thing's pretty cool. Uh, in well, a matter was, of minutes, I have gone full circle was, on the I Sierra hybrid. At, I was trying to... Uh, so here's a funny thing. Uh, you know, we're doing this series where we're, we just uh, we just bought um, an excursion recently, and uh, you can go to the Classics channel. And as you know, we do a series called um, No Pavement Needed. And the first iteration of that was... We bought a bunch of uh, pickup trucks uh, and took them off road uh, under fi- under five k, and then we thought, let's make it even less uh, expensive. So the budget went to uh, for a few bucks less. So we spent twenty five hundred, and now we're the latest version of it is go big, and so we're buying these big old SUVs. Uh, and I was looking at uh, buying a Cadillac Escalade Hybrid because I thought it was cool, right? Uh, and then I was weighing the option, and I called this guy, and I'm just I'm having a really frustrating time buying these vehicles because right now we're living in a really bad time, right? So I call the guy and I'm like, hey, tell me about this vehicle. And he said, yeah. 
Uh, it came from Kansas, which is always bad because there's rust there, so that was a red flag. Uh, and then I'm like, how's the battery? And he's like, oh, the battery's fine. And has it passed emissions? Because we have to do emissions here, smog for you Californians. And he's like, yeah, it'll pass smog. And I'm like, great. Um, do you have a clean title? And, he, and this is what he said, Tommy. He said, um, uh, no, but I can get it in five minutes. Ah. And then I was like, so you don't have a clean title? And he goes, no, but it's no big deal. I can go to the DMV. And, but if you're interested in it, uh, let me know, and I'll go and get the – and I'm like, okay, I'm interested in it. And he goes, well, first come over and pay me for it, then I'll get the title. And I was like, dude, you can't sell a car without a title. You understand that, right? And so it was one of these like – like stupid, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Except it's not a chicken or the egg. The fact remains, if you don't have a title, you don't have anything to sell. Uh, yeah, you're totally right. And then, oh, I had a worse experience. Can I tell you one more experience? Sure. So, uh, you know, we bought this excursion. I've been looking for the Suburban, but not the 1500, the 2500 HD. Yeah, which are pretty pretty hard to find. Yeah, so I found one for four and a half on the western slope in Fruita of Colorado. I call up the dude, and he actually answered, which is always amazing because half the time people don't answer. Uh, he answered, and I'm like, you know, I'm interested. This thing has 300,000 miles. Does every, my first question is, like, what's what's the history? How long have you had it? And he said, I've had it, you know, for the last 20 years. I'm like, great. That That's what I want to hear. This guy knows the truck. Mm-hmm. And then he goes, I go, is there anything wrong with it? He goes, well, there is this thing where uh, the oil pressure is dropping. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, and I'm like, really? That that's a, that's a red flag. And then he's like, yeah, but I talked to a buddy of mine who's a mechanic, and he says it's just an oil pressure gauge and it's easy repair. And, you know, with an engine with 300,000 miles on it, that could be an oil pressure gauge or it could be what, Tommy? Oh, it needs a new engine. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, could or a new oil pump or something. Main yeah. oil, oil seal, you know, head gasket, right? I'm like, okay, well, th- that's not ideal. And then I'm like, anything else wrong with it? He goes, yeah, I just, it's got, apparently these HDs, did you know this? They have two tanks. Oh, I they did have, not like, know like upstream that. and downstream. Okay. And he said, I installed a new, uh, new fuel pump uh, and I didn't seal it right. And so if you fill it up over half, it leaks gas. Oh, we're not good. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Okay, well, that's a problem. Right. So, so I've got no oil pressure and it leaks gas. Yeah. So he's asking 4500 for this. It's pretty cheap, though. 2000 yeah. And didn't he just rebuild the trans? Wasn't it he like said that? he rebuilt the trans. Yeah, this 2000 Suburban HD. And then I'm like, okay, anything else? Because I'm in Colorado in the front range and we have to pass emissions. And he's like, oh, uh, yeah, it's got a check engine light on. Okay. And I'm like, oh, that's bad. He goes, oh, no, don't worry about it. I know why it is. Yep. And I go, why is it? He goes, well, the uh, uh, oxygen air sensor is missing. And I'm like, okay, how do you know it's missing? He goes, well, the cat went bad and I cut it out. Yeah, okay, there you go. <laughs> so <laughs> no oil pressure, leaking gas, and no cat. Yep. <laughs> and check engine light. Yep. So you, you still think it's worth 4500 yeah. With 300,000 miles? Uh, yeah. It's, it's I mean, that, the, that, at that this point. This is the market we are in at this point. At that point, point that, that's like right to the junkyard, <laughs> right? It's still a 2500 <laughs> Suburban, though. I mean, it's bulletproof six liter, right? It's got the well, the, the well, big axle. Bulletproof six liter with no oil pressure. It could be a it could be a sender, you know. It could be the sensor. That's what he said. Uh huh. There I'm, you go. When I'm buying these cars, <laughs> I'm going to assume it's the worst possible thing, which is like a blown head gasket or you know a real uh, a main seal. I don't think a head gasket would give you low oil pressure. How about but, a main seal? Um, probably not either, unless it's just gushing oil. But it, it could be a, a number of things that have gone wrong. I think that it is a wild west right now for buying these affordable SUVs. Because there's just no such thing as an affordable SUV in this market. Everything is super expensive. So, uh, so yeah. I mean, it's still for sale. Right? We can call them No, up, but that's can, okay. We, I don't, I don't, but the issue is, like, if they were such, I mean, to your point, if they were such a small and easy thing to fix, then why doesn't he just fix them? Because then he could, in theory, get more money for it. So Yeah, we could drive five hours, load it up trailer it back here, take it to Toby, uh, and then you could, you know, risk, uh, throw the dice. It could be, you know, a 500 to to $1,000 repair, or it could be replace engine, new cat, which is going to cost at least 500 if not more, uh, and, you know, new fuel tank. So you, you could you easily be looking at a five to $10,000 repair on a vehicle that at, at its best won't be worth more than, let's say, seven to 8000 right? Totally. Because it's, it's got 300,000 miles on it. Totally, yep, yep, it's it's a problem. All right, shall we keep going? What's next, dude? Yeah, so next up on the list, this was um, a car that just wasn't very good. <laughs> and I kind of liked it when it was new, but in retrospect, I think it, it kind of fell flat, flat on its face. The Mercedes GLA and its sister car, the Infiniti QX30, now, the, uh, the, the GLA was supposed to be the small, affordable Mercedes SUV. 
which it was. It was the cheapest SUV in the lineup, but it just felt so bad. I mean, it just it, the material qualities were bad. The noise, vibration, and hardness was or harshness was was pretty poor. It didn't ride well. I, I mean, it just it didn't feel like a Mercedes uh, driving it. And, and maybe here in the U.S., right? We we are spoiled by the really fancy Mercedes. Abroad, they get much more affordable models, but especially when this car came out, I was pretty disappointed. So back in the day, like platform sharing was the thing that it went out of control, and usually um, people didn't like it, and it died because people realized that it was just, uh, you know, uh, uh, an inexpensive way for companies to increase uh, their model lineup without actually, you know, coming up with a new car. So uh, it, it, people pe people learned that they did not want cars that shared platforms. And then it went away for a long time, and now it's back. And there are three examples of it. And I, once again, I think the same problem exists today that it existed back then, and that is the reputation of these cars just take a huge uh, um, dump because people think it's not a newly engineered or interesting car. So uh, the Infiniti QX30 is a Mercedes GLA, and if you look under the hood, you see all the little Mercedes badges, uh, and it just drives people crazy. Same thing can be said about the Supra and the BMW, right, and the Fiat uh, 124 and the Miata. That's why it's called the Fiat. Uh, and I think from just, a, a, you know, whether these are good cars or bad cars is almost irrelevant because the immediate reputation that they get is that they're just like, you know, like, 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 uh, Tarted up versions of a different car. That that's what most people think about these vehicles. So, uh, you know, the the, the 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 reputation that gets established is, uh, you know, Infinity has this great G QX30 uh, that you're not supposed to know. Nudge nudge, wink wink, is really a Mercedes Benz underneath. Or or you know, Fiat has a 124 that you know the average buyer should know that it's really a Miata. Um, and you know. God knows what happened with the Supra. Uh, that's even, you know, that's even more of a discussion that we probably shouldn't, this can of worms we shouldn't open right now. Well, I'm going to peek into that can of worms. All right, go for it. Because you bring up a lot of great points, and I, I, I think that in a lot of instances, yeah, perhaps you do dilute the brands a little bit. But if you look at, like, the FRS and the BRZ, if you look at the Supra and the Z4, these are vehicles that are very low volume and do not offer a lot of profit potential to the manufacturer. And when you talk to the manufacturers, the, the kind of um, aura or the vibe they give you is that without this platform sharing, there wouldn't be a FRS or a BRZ because it would be too much money for Toyota to go out and do that by themselves. Uh, it would be too much money for Subaru to go out and do that by themselves. Same thing with the, the Supra and the Z4. Because the fact of the matter is, like, everyone says they want these cars, and then very few people go out and buy them. So the companies just don't make a lot of money on these low-volume sports cars. So I am grateful that they do exist, even if it does mean your Toyota has a Subaru engine. Yeah, I've heard that argument, and I would counter it that, okay, like, let's say you're Fiat uh, and you don't have the money to develop your own car, even though you've got a pretty incredible brand history of having a you know pretty cool convertible. So you partner with Mazda, which is also a small company. So you've got two relatively small companies then who build, you know, a same the same version of basically one car that's already been engineered. But, dude, Toyota is the world's biggest car company. You're telling me that they can't afford to take their, one of their most iconic brands, Supra, and actually build it from scratch uh, and create their own version of it as opposed to sticking a BMW straight six. Now, there's nothing wrong with that BMW straight six. Uh, it's a wonderful engine, but you feel like all the switch gear and all the you know infotainment is BMW. So I would just, why not just go buy the Z3? Because the reason Toyota is the biggest company is because they build products that make money. Right? They are a very prudent manufacturer that's smart about the choices they make. And yeah, and then they should be proud of the fact that they don't have to take somebody else's granted great engine and put it in their vehicle. Yeah, I mean, I mean, at, some, at some point, it, it, it would be like, okay, we're, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're in Super Bowl season, right? Yep. It would, it would be like, you know, the two teams sharing a quarterback. I, I'm not sure that the fans would be over the moon about that. I think that if you're going to ask someone to build your turbocharged straight six, it better be BMW. I mean, Toyota doesn't have a turbocharged straight six at the moment, as far as I know. And the cost it would take to build that engine yeah. would far exceed any I any think, tiny percentage of profit margin uh, they get out of the. I the think you're, I think you know you may be 
drinking the company. PR it's fantastic. Kool-Aid. Have you driven? You drove the Supra. I don't fit in it, so I don't it's think it's fantastic. A, it's a lovely <laughs> car to drive. <laughs> the, the, the roof line is too short. That engine is an absolute screamer. <laughs> I, I, if you can't, if you're listening to this as a podcast, I'm tilting my head left because that's the only way I can get my head into the vehicle. Once again, it's one of those cars that is designed for you know people who are on on the smaller of st- statures. If you had just made, it would have really hurt to make the roof line just a half an inch. You know, let's say five millimeters or one centimeter taller. I don't think it would have affected the profile that much and it would have made it drivable for people like me. Right now, I just don't fit in the car. The Supra is going to be one of those cars that goes down in history. Everyone complains, oh, it's got a, it's got a BMW engine. It's, it's, not a, it's not a real Toyota. And then we come back a few years later when the Supra is discontinued and we're going to be like, what the heck were we thinking? That was an, an incredible turbocharged straight six. The chassis dynamics were amazing. The steering was great. We need this car back. And Toyota's going to be like, sucks. You hated it. <laughs> you don't get another one. So yeah, I think, you may be right. I'm I, not, I'm not, I, I think you may be right about that. But I would have still rather had seen Toyota just as a point of pride. You know, they, they also have, Tommy, their own engineering department. And they have some pretty incredible power plants, right? You know, this excuse that they had to go to BMW for the sure. chassis. Sure, yeah. They I mean, they, they the, have their own chassis. They have their own power plants. They've You know, they've got uh, an entire division that's dedicated to building sports cars. Akio Toyota said that they have to infuse more sport car passion. So just do it yourself. I mean, like I said, would you would you watch the Super Bowl if they shared a quarterback? Maybe, but I don't think it'd be as interesting. I think it'd be pretty cool, actually. <laughs> if it made the game more interesting, then I say let's do it. Especially if that one quarterback got injured. How about this? If the choice <laughs> is watching the game with a shared quarterback or not watching the game at all, I would watch the game with the shared hey, quarterback. How about, how about that's, not, that's not a fair choice. How about the choice is you watch the game with a shared quarterback or you watch the game with two different quarterbacks who may not be as good as a shared quarterback? It's not an option. It's not an option because <laughs> Toyota true. wouldn't do it. There was just no money in the Supra. If they, they could have spent $3 billion developing their own platform for it, but there's no money there. This, they're they're this, not going to make the money this, back. This is how you get to the eco sport and the Patriot because this is what happens when the bean counter is right. Uh, get a hold of a company, they'll be like, oh, there's no money. There's no, you know what I mean? I think it's, it's like, here's an example. I'll give you an example of this, okay? Toy, can I can I make one, yeah, one thing before it. I make the example? Yeah. Toyota has done that exact thing that you're saying one time. Um, and it was a phenomenal car, but a monster failure, and it lost them a ton of money. You know what I'm talking about? The Lexus LFA. I mean, they lost so mm. much money on the LFA, and it was such an incredible piece of engineering. Yeah, but that was, a, that was a, first of all, first of all, dude, if you expect to make money on a supercar, then you, your name better be Ferrari uh, and not Toyota, right? So th- I, that is not a valid example, right? A valid example from my point of view would be like uh, the Amarok. You know, it had, Merce- had, had had Volkswagen brought in the Amarok 10 years ago, that would right now be their most popular car by far. It would account, I, I'll make a bold statement, it would account for 50% of all car sales for Volkswagen had they actually, you know, taken the time and the money uh, to, to import an engineer, I don't know, do it like Mercedes did with the van where you take it apart and put it back together to get around the chicken tax or build it in America. That would be, that car right now would account for 50% because there is no mid-sized truck in America that doesn't sell less than almost 100,000 units. Pause. And that is exactly why it would be a huge success. But show me a sports car in America that sells that volume. There you go. That's the problem. You can sell a mid-sized truck for huge volume. You can't sell a sports car in America right I, I now. Don't for big I, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, the cool thing that's, that we're living through right now is a kind of a renaissance where people are reinventing cars and are mixing and matching segments in some ways. And so, you know, it really depends on, on the vehicle. Like, here's another opportunity for, for Toyota. You know, rebadge the Tundra as a Lexus, and I will promise you, within two years, it'll be your number one selling Lexus. Thousand percent. And they won't do it. Anything truck wise, they should absolutely. And, and they won't do it. They could build thirty times the. And uh, uh, you know, it's, and they won't do it because they'll be like, uh, it won't sell. It's a, they'll use the same rationale that they but did look, to partner on the Supra. It's 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 harder to make an argument about against selling a truck because the best selling vehicle in America is a truck. But it's quite easy to make an argument against developing your own sports car because sports cars, they just don't sell. Look at the numbers. They don't sell. You know, like so this video series that we're doing, right, this video series does not make us money, right? We're buying three – the budget for it – 
just for the purchase of the cars, not the video budget, is thirty thousand, right? Because we're going to spend at least ten thousand on on the excursion, the suburban, and whatever else we buy, right? It's not going to make us money. We're going to lose money on it, but we do it because. Uh, people love it. Our fans appreciate it. Uh, and it's a point of pride with us because that is kind of a TFL signature that, that we've developed over the years that we want to develop into something that, that, that is, you know, a, a calling card for the company. So sometimes maybe you do something not because it makes money, but because, you know, it's the right thing or the cool thing to do. And, and oftentimes I found when you go down that road, eventually it will make money because people then understand that, that you're putting your livelihood on the line and not just doing something that you know it will immediately generate revenue because that stuff is usually pretty boring. And now we know why Akio Toyoda is significantly more successful than we are. Yes, very true. He is much I more think, successful than I still than think that are. my example holds true. <laughs> you know, appar- apparently, you know what I heard about him? Apparently he's got a house here in, in America. Yeah, he has a Toyota 2000 GT. Yeah, that he, uses, that, he, that he just, when he shows up in America, he drives around. How cool is that? that you know, that's about, how much is that car now? A million dollars? Maybe we would have a million dollars if we stopped doing series that don't make money. Um, and I think I still think the Lexus LFA is a good example of them coming through, showing us what they can. All right. Well, we we're running out of time here. What's uh, what's number two? Let's get let's yeah, finish this up. Number two was a vehicle. Um, speaking of making money, right? The Leaf is an interesting story. Uh, it's said that Toyota lost money on the first couple generations of Prius. Okay. That they were investing in the future, yeah. and that it wasn't until later on in the Prius lineup where they would start making money. Now the Nissan Leaf, I've heard, is a totally opposite story. The Nissan Leaf was launched under Carlos Ghosn, yeah. who was a brutal cost saver and said absolutely everything has to make money. And the Nissan Leaf launched, and he said from the get-go, this car has to make money. And it was kind of a pile, <laughs> let's be honest. Now, it was one of the first massly would... available affordable EVs, but it was just it I was would not go a good further car. Than that. I think the Leaf set, set back electric cars by 10 years. If Tesla hadn't come along, we'd still all be driving. Uh, you know, the same old uh, gas <laughs> yeah. guzzler. Because what Nissan did, which is one of the worst, I think, business mistakes you can do is overpromise and underperform, right? They said you're going to have an affordable. And then they had this marketing idea where 60 miles of range was going to be plenty when in real life 60 miles of range is nowhere near plenty because they said the average person drives less than 30 miles to work, so 60 miles is fine. Uh, but they, you know, people also stop for dry cleaning and take their kids to school and pick up their dog and blah, 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 blah. Uh, uh, And the other bad thing about it is they didn't climate control the batteries even though they knew batteries needed to be climate controlled. And then the batteries started to go bad especially in places like Arizona. And so not only did you, re- did you create a reputation for electric cars being unusable, but also uh, unreliable. And yeah, that's why it, I think terrible. they set back electric cars. Plus, the damn thing's ugly. Sorry, Nissan. It's just ugly. Stop building it already. And the first-gen Leaf um, 2011 launched for the first model year, got like 80 miles of range. Like you mentioned, air-cooled batteries, and especially the early ones, quickly degraded because they got too hot. And then that's when we saw the stories where, oh my God, my six thousand dollar Leaf needs a twenty five thousand dollar battery. No, people, they did improve them eventually, although the new ones still use air cooled batteries. People out there probably are screaming, "Well, you got to keep it affordable." But I would argue uh, you could keep it affordable uh, without, uh, you know, giving it no range and crappy uh, batteries. Yes. Okay. So that's the Leaf story, and that brings us to number one. And this car, well, it was kind of a letdown. Now, as you know, I'm a big fan of the weird old. Um, um, weird, weird, funky cars, which is why I got so offended about the British car debacle early on in the video. Uh, but the uh, Fiat 500 launched in the US, the, the new gen, and I loved it. I was super excited about it. Super fun to drive. Manual transmission. They had the Abarth, right, turbocharged model. So they said, well, we're going to do a bigger one for, for the US market, for other markets, so that we can make it more usable. So they launched a model called the 500L. And this was, I mean, it was seriously one of the worst cars we've driven in in the job, in the time that we've been doing this. And especially as it's aged, it is not aged well. It's a big four-door overinflated 500 with one of the worst manual transmissions maybe in history. Um, It was not reliable. It did not have all-wheel drive, even in the trekking off-roady model they did. It was just a, it was a kind of a dud. Yeah, and it's funny because then they came along with the 500X, which was okay. Right, which was a rebranded, uh, actually I think the Renegade was a rebranded 500X, uh, which did have all-wheel drive, but like, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know, you know, so Fiat had the 500, which was a great car, or mm-hmm. had the 500, uh, and I, I don't understand their product launch, so they came to America with one car, and then quickly added a second worse car, uh, and then added a rebranded car, and then added another rebranded car, right, it seems like Sergio at the time 
was just desperate to bring vehicles, no matter how how unreasonable or un- inappropriate they were for the American car market. I just never felt like Fiat actually had any kind of a strategy. Like nobody, like like nobody, even like you know, a high schooler could have put together ah. a better five year plan for the brand than than those guys did. That's funny. It was just a mess. And the funny thing is every time I say this, there's always, always someone in the comment section that's like, I love my 500L and that's great. I mean. Once again, every. I appreciate every it, has has, fan base. it has its fan base. Yeah. But it is it is a kind of a pile. There's and just it's, nowhere it's, it's, around it. Look, the problem with the L is it's not the car itself. It just represents. A, no, it's the car itself. No, it, I think it represents just a really poorly planned launch. And I think, you know, if you're a dealer, you specifically feel that pain because Fiat you know, um, I, I believe if you wanted to have the dealership, you had to invest, you know, a lot of money. I'm talking hundreds of thousands or millions into building out that dealership. And then, you know, to, to, to fill it with what essentially was this kind of uh, um, half thought out uh, um, gaggle of, of, of goofy cars uh, that, were completely inappropriate for America, uh, you know, was asking a lot of Fiat dealers. I will say, I'm probably not supposed to tell a story, but I will kind of, I will tell it because it's a good story. I was at a dinner with a different company, right? Mm -hmm. A very high performance company. Yes. um, German company that builds some of the best driving cars in the world. that's just our GoPro going. That's right. Okay. Keep going. Yep. And I was talking to the engineers because they had the, the, the powertrain development and chassis engineers at dinner one night, and everyone was having fun. We were laughing. And they had purchased a 500L to test at their facility, and they were so astonished by the handling dynamics. Um, I mean, they had never seen anything like the way it handled the skid pad, the slalom, and, and anything they, they had seen. It just blew their mind that, that a vehicle could handle in such a manner. Um, I, I mean, it was just not a very good car. Yeah. That, that's, where, yeah. that's where the, the story ends. So, um, guys, let us know what you think of the top 10 surprisingly bad cars we've driven over the last 10 years. 12 years now. 13. Yeah. Oh, yeah, my God, yeah. I'm old. And then, um, uh, by the way, that beep, we, we added a GoPro so we could have a wide shot of us. So that's what that was. And I'm, I can tell you, Tommy, I'm pretty proud. I, it took me a while to come up with that, but a gaggle of goofy cars. Gaggle of goofy cars. That's, good that, work. That, that's a good I do, headline. That was very clever. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry if, if, it, if it took me a while to spit that out, but I was like, like I was thinking really hard about that. <laughs> so uh, once again, like Tommy said, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate that you spent this hour with us. Uh, uh, our podcast, by the way, Tom, is doing really well. Yeah, um, we're doing good. And yeah. it's all thanks to you guys. Yeah, um, thanks for listening and watching. We're so. climbing the charts on Apple and Spotify. So if you want to give us a, a review, preferably positive, that would be very helpful. Or if, if you hate us bickering, I, that's fine. Give us a review. Yeah, well, the bickering we need to work on. I, I agree. But, but leave but, us a comment. But yeah, but I was looking I was looking at Apple Podcast, And usually now we're getting, you know, on a good week into the top 50, uh, the number one podcast in the leisure section and in the automotive section is still car talk. So well, we're not going to. Those one, guys were incredible. One dude's dead, and the other one, of course, is retired. Yeah, but they were. I mean, I they're, they're, they're automotive royalty. That's never going to yeah. be, be surpassed, especially if we keep uh, bickering. But we'll see you in the next video. Well, they were brothers. Right. And they bickered a little bit, too, but they did it in a they funny way. They did it in a funny way. Yeah. We bicker in the way we bicker when we're at home yeah, when I forget father to, and son, yeah. Yeah, to, to clean up my room. <laughs> All right. All right. See you guys next time. Ciao.